It could have been a yellow shirt with wide lapels and some brown slacks. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Geordie. I bet you can hear in my voice that I'm not sounding quite up to top ticket, and I'm sorry for that. You say that, but you sound pretty normal. Do I? I'm not inside your throat. I don't know if there's itchy and scratchy going on. Yes, there's all of that. They're both there, partying. (laughs) (laughs) Partying. Partying like it's 1999 when in fact... It's 2024. Well, I'm glad you said it, Michelle, because obviously I'm having difficulties with the year numbers, but I'm not going to have trouble this year because regular listeners to this podcast will know that I've been trying to say 2024 since January 2023. Yes. It's like you mentally wanted to skip last year somehow. Why is that? I don't know. It wasn't a bad year. You know, we'd all come off the back of bloody COVID. We're all happy to have a lovely year where we could holiday and go to restaurants and do all the normal things. Perhaps that's why, because maybe I just thought, maybe I got confused because a lot of things happened in those two (laughs) years where we weren't allowed to go out. And perhaps I thought, I don't know, the passage of time, it's a weird thing. And it's objective, I suppose, subjective. What's, what is it when it's you? It's subjective, isn't it? The word I'm looking subjective. for. Subjective. But I think the key word perhaps in your last sentence was confused. confused. Maybe you're just confused, Jordy. <laughs> There's a very strong likelihood that that is the case. Shall we introduce our lovely selves, my shell? I'm Michelle. That's right, because I just said that. You're Michelle. She's the little one with braces. I'm the tall, funny one. I'm Geordie. She's funny too. And you're in a wild ride and it's called eavesdropping. That makes you an eavesdropper because you're listening in to us. And as an eavesdropper, I want to say congratulations to you. Congrats for finding us, for listening to us, for yes. sticking with us. And we hope that you stick with us in this coming year because we've got good shit coming up. We do have good shit as she said, coming up. And I'm hoping that you do stick with us because I did mention recently, Michelle, that one of our listeners finds it hard to tune in all the time because of the hard things that we talk about. Sometimes we do sad stories like there's murders and there's awful things, dark things. And actually, Michelle, you and I were recently talking, weren't we, about our listenership because we've had a flurry of emails and a flurry of voice notes coming in from you guys. Keep it up. We love that. And I've got a lovely little conversation going on with one of our tip top fans, Shari, who obviously turned, uh, should we say the number, last week. Congratulations. We gave you a little shout out for that, Shari. And you sent us a little message about the Christmas episode, which I'd like to try and play for you now, listeners. Oh my God, Geordie, I have to send you a message because I listened to that podcast last night and it was great. Oh my God, so good. Thanks, Michelle, as well. Um, but your comment on Wicker Man, <laughs> I totally agree. I refuse to fucking see that other version. You've got to be fucking kidding me. Nicholas Cage, no, can't do it. And I'm like that with Carrie as well, refuse to see the remake. The only time I thought a remake was great... Suspiria because Tilda Swinton was in it but that was it. (laughs) Shari as you heard just said that she totally agrees with me two weeks ago in the Christmas episode I spouted off I suppose is the word we could use about remakes and it was off the back of you saying that there was a new version without the word in Fairy Tale of New York and then I lost my shit about the Wicker Man remake which I think was pointless, as I said. She agrees with that. And she added Carrie, which I wasn't even aware that they did a new Carrie. What the fuck is the point of that? No one can beat Sissy Spacey. Don't do that. But one remake that she just talked about there that she did like, and she gave her reason being as Tilda Swinton, who actually plays three parts in this remake, Have you seen that film she mentioned, Suspiria? No, I haven't seen the original or, I guess, the remake. I don't think I'm going to watch either because I did a little Wikipedia-ing about it. The original was a 1977 movie by Italian filmmaker Dario Argento, 
who is Asha Argento's dad. Yes. And I know about her because she was a spokesmodel for Miss 60 when I worked for them many years ago. And it was a supernatural horror. Didn't we do something on her on the podcast? Isn't she to do with Me Too? She was very heavily involved in the Me Too movement or something happened to her or maybe it was something to do with families because I think Dario and Asha Argento had some weird, something weird going. I don't know. Yes, there was something. I can't remember. Me either. Oh gosh. Is this what it's going to be like for It's a bit like the Brocard Eduardo story last (laughs) week. The more I think about that, I think that maybe I never did tell originally the story about Brocard and Edward. No. <laughs> but I was convinced yes. that I had told everybody this is what happens when you get older. Top of this episode I said confused. Perhaps we should rename the podcast to Confused Segways. <laughs> confused Tangents. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm telling you about Suspiria. Listen to me. Listen to me. So Dario Argento, right? He made this film, a supernatural horror about a ballet school that was built on a witch's coven where weird things happen. Mm-hmm. And his original idea was that the ballet school, I got some trivia facts about the original, that the ballet school would accommodate young girls no older than 12 years old. But his dad, who was also the studio producer, Salvatore Argento, said no. He said it's a violent film and if it had children in it, the film would be banned. So he instead raised the age limit of the characters to 20, but he didn't rewrite the script. So the naivety of the characters and the occasionally childlike dialogue, it still remains. Weird. Is it weird? I don't know. I haven't seen it. Then he put all the doorknobs at about the same height as the actress's head so they would have to raise their arms to open the doors just like children would. What? is the point of that i'll tell you something my 12 year old is taller than you so that didn't exactly fly <laughs> i mean it was going to happen you know her legs are longer than my entire body so i haven't seen suspiria old or new but everyone loves a bit of tilda swinton don't they so if i ever think about watching a supernatural horror starring tilda swinton in three parts mm. she plays three parts in this new version and dakota johnson's in it as well then shari i will take your top tip thank you I think Tilda Swinton is the unsung Meryl Streep of the acting world. Yeah. You know, she doesn't get the accolades, but she's good. Has she won a prize? Has she had any of those golden statues, Oscar thingies? I don't know. They'd give her a Logie if they could, I'm sure. (laughs) Oh, the Logies, they come out thick and fast. For those of you who aren't Australian, the Logie is the national television and is it films as well? Oh, I don't even Awards? remember. I don't know. But it always used to be poor old Bert Newton who's popped his clogs anyway. Oh, poor old Bert Newton. Moonface, they used to call him. <laughs> didn't oh, they? Dear. Old Moonface. Old Moonface. <laughs> That's a nice nickname for you. He was like the Bob Hope of Australia, wasn't he? Oh. If anyone remembers Bob Hope. I mean, we're losing all of our Gen Zs right now. They're like, we're listening to our grannies. That's basically what they're thinking. (laughs) Which goes back to a conversation we were having about our audience, our younger listeners, possibly. We think that they're goths. Or they think we're goths dressed as soccer mums. That's right. You did posit a theory, didn't you? That maybe we're attracting, you know, people who, like us, dabbled with being a goth in in their heyday. Maybe they still are. I'm not sure. Yeah. I was kind of a fair weather in it for the makeup and the black clothes. I wasn't really true. Truly gothy at any point. It was more Friday nights, the gold lame twin set dress from the charity store. And Gosh, that sounds amazing. It was. I wish I still had that stuff. Then, you know, Saturday night. Down the Manhattan. Yeah, down, down the, the hat. hat. Well, that's it. On the Saturday night, you'd be down the hat. I'd have the black paisley shirt, the Doc Martens, Robert Smith teased hair and some gothy makeup. Yeah. I'd have the Susie Sue makeup. And there was always a goth or two in the club. I do remember a guy, I can't remember his name. He was a bit older than us and he had a cape and he spoke pixie quite fluently. A cape. Yes, he spoke pixie. I'm not so enthralled by that. I just love the idea of a cape. I love that. Mm -hmm. Maybe he had a pipe as well. A what? A pipe. No, he didn't have a pipe. No. I can imagine a little gothy pipe and and a cape. But we could smoke in nightclubs back then, Michelle. That's how long ago it was. I hated it. It was fun at the time you come home. Stink. Bathed in tobacco smoke. But not anymore. You know, I'm clean living. Speaking of kind of clean living, you know, I've signed up to all these bloody wellness emails and, you know, you get little quotes and whatnot every day, a daily. What, like an affirmation? Kind of. And one of them came through. 
and it was sort of one of those things, I look back at the year that was, and I thought, oh, maybe this could be timely. And it says, make the time to dig a little deeper and ask yourself the following questions. Yeah. It was to do with 2023, obviously. We're now in 24. Cast your mind back to last year, just those few days ago. What are you most thankful for in okay. 2023? And it's so funny, when I get asked these things, I draw a blank. I'm like, I don't know what I'm thankful for. Well, I think that's a really tall ask to think about one year and say, what am I really thankful for? But I did read something in a psychologies magazine or something that said the same kind of thing. And it said, cast your mind back to last year. And here's a list of questions. And that way you can kind of help yourself to plan ahead for this year to see how you want to manifest or what you want to do. This year, what's your word? Everyone's saying there's a word this year. Choose a word that embodies 2024. They ask you to use your diary so you can go back through and see. Like, so that month I went back to Australia for a funeral for my mother. That month I went to the French Alps. That month I did this. That month I had COVID. Whatever, you know, it kind of helps you to paint a picture of your year, I suppose. And you jot it down. It's journaling. It's fun. And it helps get a sense of yourself. Who has the time for journaling? You have to make time, Michelle. You have to make time for journaling if it's what you want to do. And it's part of self-care to get to know yourself better. Because I do like what that little email said to you, which is dig deeper. Stop living on the surface. Yeah, we're all busy. Yeah, we're doing multitasking. We're doing about five things at once. But dig deeper. Take the time. It's self-care, babe. I know it's self-care, but I gloss over it. It's down the list of priorities. So you're still on the surface. You need to dig deep. Maybe 2024 is the year, hey? We'll go to the Swedish countryside with a pen and paper (laughs) and no Wi-Fi. And we'll do a retreat, just you and me. That sounds fun and terrifying. Oh, God. (laughs) All at once. Maybe we'll just go swimming. Well, look, speaking of digging deep, I actually dug deep, kind of. Into this week's topic. Okay. And in fact... It's your one-hander. It's my one-hander. It did take some time to look at this because... Right. It's not... It's a doozy? Well, it's not a surface subject like we were just talking about. There's a lot going on under the surface. So this week, I am going to take a little bit of a deep dive into a subject that was a request from our White Witch Safka. Oh. And she asked us to look into a tragic accident from the 1970s in Sydney, Australia, at one of the country's most iconic locations. Let's jump into our time machine. I'm turning the dial back, taking us to the night of June 9th, 1979, at Sydney's Luna Park, which for anyone who is not Australian. You need to describe Luna Park to people. I do because it is the premier amusement park in the country. It's iconic. It really is. It's right on the foreshore of Sydney Harbour. It overlooks the Harbour Bridge. It overlooks the Sydney Opera House. It's been open since 1935 and it's built on Crown Land, which means it belongs to the country of Australia. Crown Land? Isn't that the Queen though? Well, it's the government. Sorry, the King. I don't think he actually owns it. I think it's just a term for it doesn't belong to an individual. It belongs to okay. the government. The country. Although they fucking sell off everything. But anyway, it is one of the most incredible locations in Sydney. And one of the most iconic things about this park is the big, crazy, giant face at the entrance. Love it. That you have to walk through the mouth to get into yes. the park. Whenever I went to Sydney with my family, I used to love standing on the other side and looking across. I wouldn't even notice the bridge that everybody looks at when they come to Australia, the Sydney Harbour Bridge. I'd be training my eye. I just wanted to see that little face. It was little from far away, that mad face, which is kind of reminiscent of that Beatles film, Yellow Submarine, you know, the blue meanies and you know, that kind of style of animation, the colours and the mad clowny white faces with great big mouth. You walk through the mouth when you go in there. Yeah, to get into the park. It's kind of manic. It's a manic face. It's not a welcoming, Mm. happy, big, smiling face. It's kind of demented. 
Yes. What it is, I think it's kind of the stuff of dreams for all Aussie kids to go to Luna Park. And do you remember those fairies on a stick, Cupid dolls? On yes. A stick? I used to love those. Well, it was on a stick, but they had a, a curve, like the end of an umbrella, a handle, and a Cupid doll, which is basically a toilet dolly without yeah. the big toilet roll dress. And I loved them. Aside from the Cupid dolls, there are roller coasters. There's dodgem cars. You know, you go there and eat fairy floss and dag with dogs. And yeah. it is just part of the Australian cultural landscape to go to Luna Park. I think everyone sort of does have a bit of a fond place in their heart for Luna Park. And in Australia, June is pretty much the start of the winter. And on this particular night in 1979, the temperatures were dropping and it was really starting to get cold. The weather combined with a transit strike across the state of New South Wales. Transit strike. So all public transport was on strike. So this meant that trains... This is the 70s. 79 were Well, lots of strikes. Do you remember that the lights used to go out regularly and you'd have mm-hmm. to have, like, there was planned nights with no electricity? Yeah. That happened here in England as well. Yeah, it's crazy. But it was one of these weekends. So that meant trains from all over the state were delayed or cancelled, which meant families who'd planned to go to Luna Park had to either delay or cancel their whole trip. That night, Luna Park wasn't as crowded as usual, but there were still loads of families and kids there enjoying the rides. According to pretty much everyone, the ghost train was hands down the most popular ride in the park. People could not get enough of it. And if you went to Luna Mm. Park, you went on the ghost train at least once, which meant there was always a queue to get in. And it was two and a half minutes long. It was this creepy train ride where... You know what I'm talking about. You know, like a skeleton is has like a little hand that touches you or, you know, some weird fabric that's meant to feel... Yeah, and things spray yeah, in your face. all that stuff. Like It's awful. <laughs> I didn't do that one, but I did one recently at the Bearded Theory Festival in Derbyshire la- last year and I had my eyes shut the whole time. Oh, my God. I was horrified, terrified. Really? Well, I mean... Yes. It's pitch black. You go in... You're in, you know, the ghost train. So it's all train carriages, but open. You go in and it's pitch black and then things are lit up and it's scary noises and all that kind of rubbish. I will say that a lot of my information today does come from a great investigative three-part documentary from 2021 called Exposed, The Ghost Train Fire. Oh, my God. Yeah, that aired on the ABC, which... In Australia, it's the Australian Broadcasting Commission. It's one of the TV channels. And a fantastic uh, journalist called Caro Meldrum Hanna did wonder if she was related to Molly, Molly Meldrum. Uh, She took a deep dive into the details of that night. And she actually interviewed a guy called Tony Jacob, who was 16 at the time and one of the ride operators at Luna Park. And he was on the ghost train. And he basically said the ghost train job at Luna Park was the best job of his life. He loved it. And at 16, it gave him real kind of cachet. You know, he'd wear his Luna Park uniform on the train and people, Mm. yeah, and I think mainly girls would be like, oh, wow, you work at Luna Park. (laughs) And then he'd be like, I'm on the ghost train. And people would be like, (gasps) what's the uniform? Oh, I don't know. I'm just thinking like a red cap and candy stripes. No, I don't I, know if it's particularly sexy. I don't know that it was sexy. It was probably just you could see that he worked at Luna Park. I have to have a look. It could have been a yellow shirt with wide lapels and some brown slacks. Yes, as you like to say, <laughs> <laughs> the old. <laughs> so, like I said before, this ride, fake cobwebs on your face and scary noises. And the thing is, people lapped it up. Like I said, this was 1979, but. The ride at that point was over 40 years old. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, huh? Yeah, but I also think it had some kind of nostalgia for people, you know. And Uh it was the top... Rickety, rickety ride. And it was really the top rated ride at the park. And loads of people, one after the other, they'd pile into the ghost trains, cars, ride through the spooky ride and come back for more. And that night, the Godson family were just one of hundreds of families who rode the ghost train. Now, going to Luna Park was a big deal for the Godson family. They travelled to Sydney from Warren, which is a tiny country town northwest of Dubbo. 
which is in central New South Wales for our non-Australian listeners. Yes, it's not far from uh, the food bowl of Australia. Yes. It was a, a family holiday that they'd been saving up for for a long time. And the kids were so, so, so excited about going to Luna Park. And they were a family of four. There was John, Jenny and their two boys who were young. They were like under 10. One of them might even have been under five. Damien and Craig. And they, like a lot of people, they'd been delayed in getting to Sydney because of the transit strike. So once they finally arrived, they made the most of their time in Sydney, going to, you know, Taronga Zoo and seeing all the sights. And on their last day of their holiday, June 9, the big thing the kids had been waiting for the whole holiday was happening. They were going to Luna Park. So they jumped on the ferry, went across Sydney Harbour to what was going to be, you know, like the fun night, fun last night of their holiday. And once they got there, they went on every ride possible. They had a ball, but the kids were getting tired and Jenny and John realised it's time to go home. And it was late. It was like around 10 o'clock. And they thought they'd used up all their tickets for the rides, but then they discovered they actually had four tickets left, enough for one more ride for the whole family. So John and Jenny said to the boys, what do you want to go on? And they were like, ghost train. So they went back and uh, started walking across the park. But then Jenny, out of nowhere, had a hankering for an ice cream, which was weird for her because she apparently never normally ate ice cream so she said to John and the boys do you want an ice cream and they were like no so she was like okay I'm gonna get myself one wait for me and we'll all go on the ghost train together yeah so she went off to kind of get the ice cream but then she sort of turned around and realized oh yeah they've gone so they're probably waiting at the ghost train for me she got her ice cream and then walked back to the ghost train but I'm gonna pause that story to tell you about a group of five young boys who were all aged between 12 and 13. And they were from kind of the Bellevue Hill area in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. They were out on what was going to be the most exciting night of their lives. So we have Richard Carroll, Jonathan Billings, Seamus Rahili, and Michael Johnson. And look, they were private school boys from upper middle class families from the posh part of Sydney you know, like I said, they went to private school. They were inseparable, this group of four boys. By all accounts, actually, they were just really nice kids, friendly and popular, good at sport. They were actually particularly nice to a younger kid called Jason Holman from the neighborhood, who was a year younger and just loved to tag around with them. They let him tag along with them that night to Luna Park. Now, for anyone who's thinking, so... Four sets of parents let a group of 12 and 13-year-olds go to Luna Park on their own. And stay out till 10 o'clock at least. That's late. It is. Well, it was the first time that any of them had been allowed out without parental supervision. And they had been begging, begging their parents for months to be allowed out. Plus, this is the 70s as well, which means, you know, kids basically raised themselves most of the time. And I think parents felt like it was safe. It was safe to let the kids do this. You know, finally, after months of begging, the parents relented. I think they probably thought, oh, this is probably going to be one of those experiences that, you know, stay in the kids' memories forever. Like the first time they were allowed to do their own thing and be a grown up. Look, these kids, they were beside themselves with excitement. They were like, yeah, we're going to hang at the coolest place in town. And they might even meet girls. And in fact, Jason Holman, who was the 12-year-old, this is a quote. He said, it was our first night out as a group of what we thought were young men being given permission and responsibility, and we knew how important it was. It was so hard to get permission, very hard, but we were heading to Luna Park, and it was the biggest thing I'd ever experienced in my life. These kids went on every ride. They were loving every second of it. The time came for the amusement park to close and they realized they did have time for one last ride before they went home so they decided Mm -hmm. has to be the ghost train so they got in line finally it was their turn and first up Jonathan and Richard got in one ghost train carriage together 
then Michael and Seamus got in the next carriage, while Jason, as kind of the fifth wheel of the group, he was alone in a carriage on his own, behind his mates. Being in the last carriage, Jason watched his friends go through the swinging entrance doors into the ride that was called Hell's Doorway. Oh, God. Then disappear into the darkness of the ride. But just as Jason's carriage was about to go through Hell's Doorway... Out of nowhere, mm. one of the ghost train attendants pulled him out of his seat and didn't let him go into the ride. Oh, my gosh. And at the time, Jason had no idea why he wasn't allowed on the ride. He says of that moment, and this is a quote, there was just a man with panic written all over his face. Oh, no. The thing is, from the outside of the ghost train, everything seemed fine. So Jason was like, you know, why have I not been allowed to go on the ride with my mates? But within moments, thick black smoke started to oh, curl no. out from underneath those entry and exit doors. And oh, then people God. from inside the ride started like stumbling out of the ghost train while inside the whole ride was filling pitch up with black. smoke. Yep, exactly. This Remember, is awful. Yep, it was pitch black inside. So there was no way that anyone could see how to get out or where the fire exit doors were so they could oh, get to fuck. safety. And that's when the mayhem started because by this stage, flames were now engulfing the whole ghost train. But oh my god, the carriages were still running, so the mechanical train was still going. So passengers were coming out, but they were coughing and screaming. Yeah, the ride was still working. A lot of people were able to get out. It's great actually that the ride was still working. Your face is looking. I'm just trying to. No, because I'm. I'm trying to think. Would it be better for it to come? I mean, I don't know where the flames are. Are they at the beginning, the middle or the end of the ride? Or is it the whole ride? Or should it be taking you through? Or should people be jumping up and climbing over and trying to come out the way they came in? I just can't even imagine. Look, I think there was a bit of all of that. From what I could see from the images of where the fire started, it was kind of in the middle. If you passed it you were kind of lucky if you were heading into it you had to make some decisions I would imagine decisions oh god poor Jason he's there watching every carriage come out of this ghost train (gasps) ride waiting for his mates to come through the exit gates and then and this was etched into his memory he said he started to just see empty carriages coming out that were just engulfed in flames Oh, and they were all coming out of the mechanical track and then really fast, like in a matter of minutes, the whole ride exploded with fire. Oh, gosh. Yep. I did not know this. And then this is a quote from Jason. He said, this fire was something different. This fire was just nuts, out of control. And it was massive. And look, in the meantime, Jenny Godson, she had her ice cream. She'd walk to the ghost train expecting to see her husband and two boys waiting for her so they could all get on the ride together. Because in those days, you could eat and drink on the ride, right? So I guess she wanted to eat that ice cream on the ghost train. But when she got to the ride, her husband and kids weren't there. They hadn't waited for her and they'd gone on the ride without her. So she was just hanging around waiting for them. This is appalling. That's when she saw smoke coming out of the ride. And this is a quote from Jenny. She said... I started to feel really strange. I had the ice cream in my hand and I just couldn't eat it. And then as she watched the smoke grow thicker and people began screaming, she just threw that ice cream away because I think she knew it was not looking good. Oh, man. There was another young ride attendant looking after the rides that night. Uh, His name was Frank Boitano. He'd been working on the water scooters ride, but he'd had a quick break and he'd gone over to see his mate, Tony Jacob, who we talked about earlier, who was like, hey girls, I'm on the... In his candy stripes. Yeah, in his candy stripes. (laughs) So he'd gone to the ghost train to see his mate, Tony, and he was about to go back to the water scooters when he heard the screaming and he and Tony saw thick black smoke coming out of the ride and they smelt this really toxic smell. They were like, fuck, to their credit... They both ran inside the ride through the exit doors. Did they? Mm -hmm. And Tony... Threw in through the exit door. Oh, my gosh. This is amazing. Tony, 16 years old, managed to switch on the overhead lights within the train. Amazing. Yep. 
Oh, bless So him. people could actually see what they were doing and try and make their own way out. And then he wow. and Frank, Tony and Frank, followed the train track, trying to find the internal doors that could help passengers take a shortcut through the maze of the ghost ride. And look, Frank actually managed to open a set of double doors as well as the fire yeah. escape doors, which meant loads of people were able to get out. But look, when Frank tried to follow Tony deeper into the maze, the smoke was just too thick and it was choking him. Mm. So at that point, he had to turn back and get outside. Mm. But the mm. train was still running, Geordie. Oh, far out. There was a caged section that was outside the maze. So you kind of went into the ghost train ride into this cage section, which was, woo, Luna Park, and then back into the ride. Yeah. So a bit of fresh air for people. And look, there were people that were in the carriages trying to get through this caged bit, but everything was in flames. And Frank says <gasps> the flames were just shooting out as if they were being fan-forced out of the cage. Oh, yep. God. And he said it just didn't look like a normal fire. It was too ferocious. Accelerant. Pin that thought. Because meanwhile, Tony had gone deeper into the ghost train maze and he was holding his shirt over his mouth so he didn't choke. He and actually two other passengers who were on the ride managed to help get a load of other people off that train and help them escape. Tony actually later received a commendation from the Australian government for his bravery that night. Amazing. But look, not everyone so escaped. Jason Holman, who was still outside hanging around waiting for his four friends to come out of the ride. Yeah. He says there were a series of like bangs and crashes and then a massive final explosion, much bigger than any of the others. The firefighters did arrive, but there was a problem with the water pressure. It was kind of like pissing in the wind. They got oh their fire hoses, God. but there was nothing coming out. They then were like, fuck, what are we going to do? So they had to start trying to pump water from the harbour to try and put that fire out by this stage the fire was too intense for the firefighters to even go in and this look for awful. anyone else trapped in yeah it's horrible it's fucking heartbreaking and the thing is at this point the firefighters now just had to focus on putting out the fire because the fireys couldn't get in to see if they could save anyone else look finally they did manage to put the blaze out and I think it took several hours. When the fire was eventually just, you know, smouldering ash, they began looking through the smoking remains for people. And that's when they found the bodies of Michael Johnson, Seamus Raheely and Jonathan Billings near the entrance of the ride. Oh, how tragic. So they'd gone straight in. And then tried to go back the way they came. Oh, so they, it was smoke inhalation. Well, yes. And they were found metres apart. So, yeah, they must have gotten out of their carriage and tried to escape on foot. And the body of Richard Carroll, he was further into the centre. So he, I guess he must have lost his friends yeah. in the panic and gone the opposite way. I think died from the smoke inhalation. And it would have been pitch black at this point. They didn't know where they were going. But at this point, a policeman had driven Jason Holman home where – you know, the policeman knocked on the door and the mom got mad, like, what have you done? Kind of thing. Mm. And then it, they had to break the news that, yes, Jason was here, but the other boys were missing. The policeman knocked on all the other doors of the other four kids and had to say, listen, we've got one of them, but the other four. At that point, they didn't know where they were, if right. they had survived or not. Oh, that's just every parent's worst nightmare. Yeah, so there was a limbo moment where yeah, the boys were just terrible. missing. Look, you know, Jason survived. He says he has spent his whole life living with survivor's guilt. Survivor's guilt. Was he the youngest one? He was 12. The one that was hanging around them? Yeah. That's why he was on the carriage on his own. Because the other four were super tight and he was the fifth wheel. Mm. But look, while they were sifting through all the rubble, towards the back of the ride, obviously towards the exit of the ride... They found the body of Jenny's husband, John Godson. Oh, no. And he was laying beside the bodies of his two sons, oh, no. Damien and Craig. And apparently John's arms were stretched out towards them, obviously trying to protect them. Yeah. Oh, this is so depressing, Michelle. Yeah, happy fucking New Year, people. <laughs> they did say that the seven victims of the fire had died of burns and smoke inhalation. So, you know, I think it was probably a combination of 
where they were in the queue of that yeah. train going around. Because remember at, at the beginning of the story, I said two and a half minute ride. Yes. It's a long ride when you're on foot. Right. In, in, when you're going two and a half minutes, yeah, through a burning exactly. passageway. Poor Jenny Godson. She, at this point, had been moved along outside of the park with the rest of the crowd. And she was in total shock. Oh, God. Where were her family? And honestly, this documentary, and I really have to recommend watching it. I think you can watch it on Netflix or ABC iView. The whole documentary is heartbreaking because the loss and sadness is so strong when they interview Jenny Godson 45 years later. I'm sure that's her entire family wiped out in one go. In a matter of minutes. Yeah, this woman lost her family. And in fact, a woman called Sue Manning, who also had been moved along out of the park that night by security, she says during the chaos, you know, as she was leaving the park, going through the laughing face, she said she saw a woman sitting on the ground just sobbing on her own. And this is a quote from her. (sighs) We didn't go near her. No one went near her. No one. I think everybody was probably just in shock and fleeing for their own lives because you didn't know if the whole park was going to go up, I imagine. Right. In the documentary, this woman, Sue, says she feels terrible that no one stopped to see if this woman was okay. Yeah, I'm sure. And she said it was only later on, after Jenny's story was all over the newspapers about losing her Mm -hmm. family, it was only then that Sue realised that that crying woman on her own must have been the mother who lost her entire family. Yeah. We got a bit bleak. We got a bit dumb. We're two birds in a bed. Just having a laugh. Going back to Sue, she was 19 at the time and she had actually been on the ghost train just minutes before John Godson and his sons and the four boys got on the ride. And she remembers when the ghost carriage that she was in swung around a bend and there was this kind of fake fire like had a light underneath it with transparent streamers that lit up and they were blowing because there was a fan that was moving them she was like wow those flames look really real that doesn't look like a fake fire and she said she remembers turning to her friend and saying that fire looks really realistic And as she said, as she went past, she said she had this urge to put her hand out and touch this fake fire because it just looked so real. Then she drew it back because she felt heat. And she said, that feels like a real fire. Mm. And her friend said, don't be stupid. And she thought, oh, maybe it could have been like heat from the light or whatever. So after they got off the ghost train, they didn't say anything to anyone because they didn't think what they'd seen was real. They thought it was part of the ride. Oh, my God. And another guy called Jeff Farlow, who was 17 at the time, he also saw this perfect little fire inside the fireplace and just thought it was part Mm. of the show. So he didn't alert the attendants (gasps) either. Another woman called Betty Schultz, who was 14 at the time, she says the whole place was dark except for this little tiny fire about the size of a shoebox that looked really very, very, very realistic. Lots of people saw it yep. and no one... No one said anything. It raised no alarms because they thought it was part of the show. Exactly. Pretty quickly, the police told everyone, papers, the world, whoever, that the fire was an accident sparked by faulty electric wiring and that everyone's accounts of seeing a real fire in the fake fireplace, they must have been wrong. They were dismissed. Not true? Yep. Okay. What's going on here? Was it just an accident? Was it a case of dodgy wiring that led to tragedy? Or was something else going on here? I don't know. Do you? Well, yeah, I do because I watched the documentary. (laughs) And this is what the documentary goes into. And honestly, it really is quite an intense three-parter. They are joining the dots where no one ever before has joined the dots. The documentary is? Yes. It's absolutely fascinating. And they uncover a lot of new evidence and talk to people who have never spoken out about that fire. Honestly, you can't watch the documentary and walk away thinking this was just a sad accident. 
And look, amazingly, the reason that so much evidence has survived is mainly down to one guy called Martin Sharp, who was this wonderful eccentric artist that lived in Sydney and who had a real passion for Luna Park because just a few years earlier in the mid-70s, he'd been commissioned to repaint that iconic entrance space. He had a real investment in Luna Park and then he kept being commissioned to paint things in the park and do things. So yeah. he really felt a connection. He was devastated by that fire and kind of got obsessed by it because he absolutely believed that the fire was not an accident but arson. And over the course of his whole life, he collected documents, he collected clippings, he went and got court statements. He even interviewed people about what happened that night and taped it, taped phone conversations. He had this room, a whole room dedicated in his house to the Luna Park fire. And in the documentary, you go in and there are books and newspapers and audio cassettes and reels of video. This guy was on a mission his whole life to uncover what really happened that night. And the thing is that Caro Meldrum Hannah and her team were given access to this room. It was all from Martin's information that they could plug the holes in the official story of what happened. Oh. And there were a lot of holes, Geordie, oh. because starting the very next day, the fire, which should have been treated as a crime scene and searched for remains and evidence of how it could have started. And also, too, you know, seven people died. This is kind of a, could be yeah. a murder or a manslaughter. Mostly scene. children, all children apart from one adult. Exactly. Six kids, one adult. Horrific. The very next day, the whole of Luna Park was cleaned up. And when I say cleaned up, I mean every single piece of that fire, every ash was removed. Nothing was what? left to investigate. And the man who ordered the cleanup was Detective Doug Knight. Now, it was an open secret at the time that in Detective Inspector Doug Knight was on the payroll of organized crime bosses. He was known as, they called him a fixer. Okay. He was in the pocket of Sydney's underworld and he would do things like corrupt court proceedings for all sorts of things by deleting or changing or destroying or manipulating evidence. I love the fact that you've said this is an open secret. So people knew that their chief of police was this corrupt, yet nothing could be done. Yep. He was untouchable. He was dodgy. He was a bent copper. He was crooked. And no one could do anything because he was the so powerful days. because he had the protection of the crime bosses. You know, he would intimidate witnesses. He would cover up arson for these crime bosses. And it was this guy, Doug Knight, who was the one that came out to the media the very next day and said, it was an electrical fault. We are not investigating arson. There is no evidence pointing to suspicious circumstances. End of story. It was an electrical fault. Look, there was a lot of evidence that pointed to arson. Right. So obviously we've already talked about the fake fire that had real flames coming out of it. A lot of people that night made statements to the police that A, they'd seen that fake fire with real fire and secondly, that they had smelt kerosene in the ghost train. Oh. And that the fire smelled like kerosene. There was also a lot of people who had reported that there was a group of bikies who had gone on the ghost train just minutes before. Oh, look at me already pointing the finger at the bikies. It's always the bikies. Well, we've talked a lot about the bikies. You know, you even blame them for bloody Melissa Caddick's foot. <laughs> I still think it's that. So the bikies get the finger pointed a lot. Yeah. But in this instance, there was a kid who had overheard them talking about setting the ride on <gasps> fire. Well, when this kid went to the police station and made his statement about what he'd seen and heard, and he described this group of bikies in detail, oh gosh. who'd been discussing setting the ghost train on fire. Yeah. Well, he gave all the information to the police. Then, hours later, same kid was hauled back into the police station yeah. and coerced into retracting 
everything mm. he'd said. What do you mean and seen. coerced? He was told if he didn't retract his statement, some bad shit was going to happen to him. How old is this kid? Bad things. 16. I fucking hate police. <laughs> I can't say that. Yeah. I hate this. Doug Knight and his team were already on it. I hate Doug Knight. seen this. I went and got this kid and basically said, take this back or... Wow. What a piece of work. Seven fucking people died. Six of them children. Who are you protecting? This is disgusting. I'll tell you who's protecting when we get to it in a minute because... Okay. This poor kid, he's now a man in his 50s, 60s. And he said he has lived a life of fear. You know, he's been scared his whole life. Sure. Because he says he knows that this was not an accident, that something and someone bigger was behind it and that Mm. he held the key to it because that's why they intimidated him. Him and his girlfriend. There were other people that also said they saw bikies that night. Honestly, the whole thing is so shonky. And I can't even go into a tenth of what is in this documentary. It's absolutely incredible. You really need to watch it. But there was also evidence that a month earlier, one month earlier, the ghost train and the whole park had undergone rigorous health and safety checks and had passed with flying colours. And in fact, apart from the odd fuse blowing on the ghost train, that thing was as reliable as clockwork. It just kept going. Wow. It was basic and it was built to last in the 40s. And it did. There were very, very few electrical elements in the ghost train ride. In the photographs of the devastation the morning after the fire, everything is like ash. This is before the cleanup. Wow. But the thing is, you can see the electrical hub that powered the ride was untouched. Right. Everything around it was destroyed. But it was standing and it was barely even smoke damaged. So if it was an electrical fault, how is it possible that this so-called fault doesn't make sense. source of the fire? No, yeah. it wasn't even singed. Doesn't make sense. And more than that, if it had been an electrical fire, don't you think the carriages would have stopped? But they didn't. They kept going round and round and help people get out. So that also doesn't mm. make sense. There are also images of the fire in full blaze that clearly show these string lights are on going into the ghost ride, which would have been impossible. So it's not the electrics. No. And also, according to firemen and engineers and eyewitnesses and coronial evidence that was suppressed, they say 100% not an electrical fault. Speaking of suppression of evidence and information, on the documentary, you basically see how every single person who gave statements and were eyewitnesses that night to what they saw and smelled never called, never called Mm. up to give evidence or tell their story of what happened, all dismissed. Someone behind the scenes was controlling the narrative in the papers and in the courts. This went right to the top at the highest levels of corruption here within the government and within the police. Doug Knight was the head of the investigation. As I said, dodgy fucking cop. He'd been accused a year earlier of receiving bribes from crime bosses, including a guy called Jack Rooklyn, who was a shonky businessman who was rigging pokey machines and club licenses. And he was just an organized crime boss. And he and Doug Knight were thick as thieves. And when I said about Mm. open secret, it's because he'd been accused of all this stuff in the paper. Open secret. It was thinly veiled. They, you know, used to go out together on the town. Doug had even accepted a job from Rooklyn, which landed him in front of the Royal Commission into organized crime in clubs. And I bring this up because, Geordie, there was this heartbreaking scene in the documentary where the mother of one of the the boys, the four boys who perished in the fire, Mm. she remembered at the funeral of her son, There was a group of wailing girls at the front of the church that she Mm -hmm. didn't know. They were young, 12, 13. They were uncontrollably sobbing at the front of the church. And it wasn't until after the funeral that the mum thought, that was kind of strange. Maybe those girls were meant to meet the boys that night. In fact, Jason Holman, the surviving boy, said, yeah, a group of girls were meant to meet them that night, but they didn't show up. Years and years later, the mum got a phone call out of the blue from one of those girls who had been crying at the church. And she said, we were meant to go to Luna Park that night, but my dad wouldn't let us go because 
he told us something bad was going to happen there that <gasps> night and he banned oh. us from going. And her dad, Jack Rooklyn. Oh, my God. That sent chills down my spine because those girls, their lives were spared, but those poor boys yeah. were left to go there. Why are they wanting to burn down a fucking ghost ride? Was it insurance? Who runs the thing? Well, remember how I told you at the beginning that it's basically on the most expensive piece of land in Sydney? Yeah. Oh, somebody wanted it. Yep. It came down to developers. People wanted to get their hands oh, on that land. bastards. Yep. And one way to do it is to burn to the ground whatever's on there. And the man behind it all is a guy who was a notorious crime boss in Sydney at the time called Abe Saffron. Now, he was dubbed Mr. Sin because he was a King's Cross gangster who basically built this massive dodgy empire from illegal gambling, prostitution, strip bars, clubs and property development. It's apparently said that he always wanted to get his hands on Luna Park, which, as we said, was owned by the state government. But the site lease for Luna Park was up for renewal in a matter of months. Ah. So in early 1980, and there was one group called the Grundy Group, very famous TV production group. Reg Grundy, Neighbours. Exactly. Well, they also had decades of experience in running amusement parks all over the country. Basically, they'd put a tender in for the lease, and it was basically in the bag that they were going to get it. Then, literally at the last second, a new bid came in from these newcomers with no experience, no nothing. Boom, they won the tender. Uh. It was a fucking stitch up. And within weeks of getting the tender, and this is a few months after the fire, yeah, because after the fire, Luna Park was shut down. But I've been to Luna Park post-79. Yes, exactly. I'll get to all of that okay. because what happened beforehand was – after this new company got the tender, everything at Luna Park was stripped. All the old rides from the 1930s and the 1940s, gone. What a shame. Every bit of beautiful old memorabilia. That would have been amazing. Clown faces. Yeah, oh. everything. It was either destroyed or put up for auction. And that shit, you can't replace it, you know. No. And for me... It was so painful to watch because the history of that park was gone in a flash because not everything was burnt down. The ghost train was gone, but everything else was still intact. Yeah, this sure. new company came in, got rid of it all, basically raised it to the ground. It was horrible, but it was rebuilt eventually. All of that beautiful antique stuff from – which you know, in today's age is nearly a hundred years old. Yeah, Can you sure. imagine how incredible that would have been? Now on paper, Abe Saffron had nothing to do with the company that got the tender. Mm -hmm. This documentary uncovers the fact that Abe Saffron's nephew, Sam Cowper, was the financial controller of this new company and was also mm -hmm. the managing director of Abe's Trust. And that his cousins, Abe Saffron's cousins, Coleman and Harold Goldstein, were shareholders and directors in this company. And they were shareholders of Abe's other company called Arcadia Gaming Machine Company. Do these people all have blood on their hands, Michelle? They fucking do. They set fire to this ghost train. Seven people were dead unnecessarily. And it could have been so many more. Oh, yeah. A lot of effort had gone into hiding the fact that Abe Saffron had nothing to do with this company that took over Luna Park on paper, but in reality, he controlled that company. And like you say, in the meantime, seven people died. Abe Saffron was being protected by senior police and politicians who somehow managed to quash any attempts to reinvestigate the ghost train fire. This is corruption at the highest levels, which meant reports and investigations into the fire were stopped in their tracks because ultimately, like we say, the fire did go beyond destruction of property and the greed of one man to get his hands on that land. It's now manslaughter. Unbelievable. And for what? Yeah. In the documentary, Paul Egg, who is a former detective senior sergeant and analyst with the New South Wales Police Bureau of Crime Intelligence, who was investigating Saffron's affairs, actually. He told the documentary that organised crime was 100% behind that fire. 
and that he says Abe Saffron ordered a group of men to torch the park. Now, was it the bikies? We don't know. But apparently that kid in the documentary who went to the police and then was told to retract his statement, he says he heard one of the bikies say to another bikey, oh, I did it. I did it. I torched it. It's on fire. Wow. And the other bikey said, why did you do that? That was stupid. You know, we weren't going to do it. Huh? Oh, they were going to pull out? Yes. So one reckless potential bikey. According to this kid. Renegade bikey decided to go ahead with the plan. Yes. Oh, man. Somebody out there has a very guilty conscience. Absolutely. People know what was going on. There are people out there who have taken this ghost train secrets to their grave. But in 2007, a year after Abe Saffron passed away, his niece, Anne Buckingham, told the Sydney Morning Herald that, yes, her uncle was behind the fire. But, and this is a quote, she said... I don't think people were meant to die. Oh. She then later retracted her statement. And Abe Saffron's son, Alan, has repeatedly denied that his father was behind the fire. So it's still a cover-up. Yeah. So the thing is that this documentary came out two years ago and it's opened a can of worms in Australia. Mm Mm-hmm. Australian police have said that they'll look into the fire again now that these fresh allegations have been made in the documentary. Good. But nothing concrete has come of it. And the families of those seven people who died are still left wondering what really happened. Why did their loved ones die? Is it a cover up? And it's just fucking awful because... Who's accountable? Who is accountable? And like you said, Luna Park is still going. It's an amusement park. It's still on that best piece of land on the harbour. The high-rise apartments that I imagine Abe Saffron thought he was going to build there, never built. But Australia lost not only a piece of history when that park was torn down, but seven people lost their lives. Like I said before, for anyone who wants to know... All the details, and there are so many that I couldn't go into in this episode. Please go and watch that documentary. Wow. It's great, but it's fucking heartbreaking. Yeah, it is heartbreaking. What you've told me today is absolutely sitting very heavily in my heart too. Devastating. But thank you, Michelle, for that comprehensive, detailed story regarding the tragedy that is Luna Park Ghost Train Fire Disaster. And thank you to Safka for writing in and asking us to take a look at it. I'm sure in my memory I must know that the fire happened. I don't really recall it. Oh, I do. I remember. We were very young, but I do remember it. Yeah, because it's kind of stayed as a legacy throughout the years. I just remember going and having the time of my life. And obviously they rebuilt it and it's wonderful. But imagine how good it could have been. There's no way that you or I would have ever gotten the benefit of that original Luna Park experience. I bet Jen went, actually. Jen, I'm going to ask Jen. Ask Jen, her. if you went to Luna Park, I want to know your memories. She did like a Dagwood dog, didn't she? She loved a Dagwood dog when she was pregnant. That's all she craved was a bloody <laughs> Dagwood dog. But I do remember mum has talked about when she was a little girl, the whole of Sydney was a tram system, one of the best tram systems in the entire world. Where's that gone? Well, governments from all over the world would come to Sydney to see how How brilliant the tram system was. And then they thought, oh, get rid of the trams, and they put buses in. We prefer buses and all that. Yeah, Yeah. you could get trams to to Taronga Zoo. Yep. It went to Bondi. It went to all the places that the train system and, you know, could never go to. So... Oh, why did they get rid of that? Trams are great for cities, aren't they? They're brilliant. I bet Jen does have some great recollections of Luna Park from those days. So I want to hear it, Jen. Maybe she can do a voice note for us. That would be lovely, Jen. We'd all love to hear from Jen the Hen. On that note, Geordie, I do think there's really only one thing left to say. Yes, well, I do think it's about time to farewell our listeners in this, our first episode of 2024. I'm going to get it right every time because in my mind, it's always been 2024. Wherever you are, whatever you do, just just keep keep eavesdropping. eavesdropping. Eavesdropping, 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 eavesdropping.